<laughs> okay. Good afternoon. We'll wait for uh, for our our participants to uh, roll into the webinar here, and then uh, we'll get started. I'm seeing numbers build up here in the participant list, so we'll just wait for this to steady, steady, and then we'll we'll go. All right. Thank you for joining us today and uh, welcome to Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's uh, March webinar. Uh, today's webinar is on the design of the WR1 and NPD reactors and uh, in situ disposal. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Algonquin nations whose traditional and unceded territory I'm uh, gathered upon today. Um, and also at the same time, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Treaty 1 and, and Treaty 3 lands, uh, which uh, the, and the Manitoba Métis uh, uh, Federation, which, uh, which uh, the WR1 reactor is uh, also housed on. So two, uh, two places and I, we've got people gathered from, from both areas. So, uh, um, uh, and I've heard that the weather uh, is similar in both areas. We're hovering around around zero. So glad to be uh, seeing the the uh, the eyes of spring finally uh, 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 joining us here in in both both areas. So as as I've said, uh, today is a joint webinar that will be comparing and contrasting the NPD and the WR1 reactors and why they are both uh, suitable for in situ disposal. Uh, the, uh, the agenda today will start with a presentation from, from, uh, from WR1, and then uh, we'll move to uh, the NPD facility with, uh, with, with then um, a, uh, uh, a Q&A session to follow. And then uh, a, at the end, we will have a, a polling question. So please uh, do stick around for that to, to help us out in, in building uh, webinars into the future. Um, I'll introduce uh, who's uh, joined it, joining us today. So uh, from the, the NPD project, we have uh, Jeff Miller. Uh, he's the manager of regulatory approvals for, for WR1. And he's been with CNL for 14 years and uh, is right now responsible for completing the environmental assessment and license amendment application for the WR1 in situ disposal. We also have Mike English, who's joining us from the NPD project. He's the facility manager at the NPD facility, and he has been with CNL for 20 years and is responsible for the operation and maintenance of the facility. Uh, he is also part of the engineering team that's responsible for the design and safety aspect uh, of the proposed uh, NPD uh, disposal facility. I have, uh, we have Katie Shorter with us today as well from NPD. She's the manager of uh, regulatory approvals for the NPD closure project. And uh, she's been with CNL for 11 years and is responsible for completing the environmental assessment and license amendment application for NPD in situ with the CNSC. I also have uh, Uzar Wasif. Uh, Uzar is a, a project engineer on the WR1 project, and he has been with us with CNL for, for about two years, supporting the license amendment application. And then finally, uh, uh, we have Graham Porter on with us today, who's uh, the, on the NPD project uh, and is uh, with the decommissioning safety and licensing of that project and has been with CNL for almost 20 years. Um, some, some technical uh, aspects, just uh, so everyone's familiar with, with how the webinar works today. Uh, the, the, the webinar is available in both French and English. 
uh, and you can access that by toggling the uh, globe icon on the, on the bottom of the uh, Zoom application. It's the bottom right. Uh, and then you can select the language you'd like to hear this, this webinar in. Um, the uh, Q the Q and A icon is found at the bottom of the screen as well, and uh, you can you can type your question into into that at any time during the presentation or uh, or during the Q and A session, and I'll help facilitate your question and uh, uh, get you an answer. Today we'll stay into in the scope of these uh, of these uh, two presentations. Uh, however, if you do have questions that are outside the scope, we are we are uh, we are wanting to to also uh, get that and and learn uh, you know other interests and things. So uh, please do still ask your questions, and and we will commit to get back to you um, uh, at at a later time to make sure that uh, your question gets answered. And then if, if something uh, does come to you, um, uh, you know, after the presentation at some point, or if uh, there's something that uh, you want to ask us, it, we're always available at uh, ermstakeholder at cnl.ca or whiteshell uh, communications at cnl.ca. Either of those email addresses come to us and, and we'll be able to uh, um, help you get answers to your questions or, or queries. And a final reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, all our webinars are uh, up from the past are all available on YouTube in both official languages. So, uh, so uh, if if you do want to go back and reference this webinar at some point or share it with uh, friends, colleagues, or family, uh, please please do so and um, uh, check out our our YouTube channel. Okay, so that is really uh, the introduction. Uh, so at this point, I will hand things over to Jeff. Jeff. Uh, good morning to everybody in uh, Manitoba and westward and good afternoon to everyone in Ontario and eastward. Um, and my name is Jeff Miller. Uh, and today we're going to give you a little bit of a walkthrough on uh, the design of WR1 and NPD reactors and how those then translate into supporting our, uh, our, our proposal to use them for in situ disposal. So as a quick outline of just what we're going to talk about, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the two projects. Then we'll get into the reactor design and construction. So a little bit of the history of how the reactors were designed and operated and how they were constructed. So I'll start with WR1 and I'll turn it over to Mike English to give you guys some information on NPD. And then we'll talk a little bit about how some of those facility features we talked about support our application for in-situ disposal within the, the safety case that we put forward. And then of course, we'll wrap it up with questions at, at the end of that. So to start things off, uh, we, CNL is really putting forward two in-situ disposal projects. The first is for White Shell Reactor Number 1, or WR1, and that's located in Pinawa, Manitoba, and that's where I'm located currently. And the other is the Nuclear Power Demonstration Reactor, or NPD Reactor, and that's located in Ralston, Ontario, and that's what Mike English is going to be talking about today. Now, uh, the WR1 reactor at White Shell uh, played a key role in the nuclear history of Canada. It was built by General Electric and first achieved criticality in 1965, serving for 20 years as a research reactor, which among other missions became a testing site for the modern Kandu fleet. It was safely shut down in 1985 and has since then been maintained in a state of storage with surveillance. NPD was the first Canadian nuclear power reactor and the proof of concept demonstration for what became the modern Kandu reactor. NPD made history uh, in 1962 when it became the first nuclear power plant in Canada to produce electricity for the grid, and it became a proving ground for research and development that led to commercial application of the CANDU system for generating electric power. The site has also been safely shut down since the 1980s. Now, both of these are legacy reactors. WR1 was a research reactor and NPD as a CANDU demonstration. Both of these were built subgrade and both are built on or into the bedrock. And both have been in storage with surveillance for over 30 years and are uniquely suited for in-situ disposal. 
Let's talk a little bit more about specific design elements of it, where I'll, I'll walk you through WR1 first. WR1 is a vertical pressure tube reactor. The pressure tubes contained the fuel bundles and carried the coolant, and around those uh, were the calandria tubes, which allowed a spatial buffer between the coolant and the heavy water moderator contained in the calandria. WR1 was a 60 megawatt research reactor and was never used to produce steam for a turbine or electricity generation. What made WR1 unique was its use of the combination of a heavy water moderator and an organic coolant, so an oil-based coolant. The organic coolant concept has several benefits that the design was meant to explore, including increased thermal efficiency, reduced operating pressures, and lower corrosion of reactor components. The reactor had locations for 55 pressure tubes, low, uh, referred to in the design often as fuel channels, and they were arranged in a hexagonal uh, pattern. These 55 channels were split into three primary circuits. So 18 of those channels went to A circuit, 19 to B circuit, and 18 to C circuit. Each of these circuits had its own dedicated primary pump and heat exchanger. Two of the fuel channel positions in C circuit were reserved for instrumentation in the core. So an in-core flux detector and a pneumatic capsule facility. So a place where experiments could be pushed into the reactor core and then removed uh, for specific experiments. Throughout its operation as well, up to four of these fuel channels, two from the A circuit, and two from the B circuit, were separated from the main loops and connected to their own individual loops for running experiments. So they could control the temperature, pressure, and flow rate in a specific fuel channel under very, under very specific conditions for their experiments. A WR1 was operated entirely by varying the moderator level in the calandria, raising the level to increase reactor power and lowering the levels to decrease reactor power. The reactor was shut down by dumping the moderator entirely from the core. No control rods were utilized in WR1. WR1 also did not have online refueling like a modern can-do reactor and had to be shut down for refueling. Refueling was done using a vertical flask and hoist system, which you can see in the picture to the right, and it was not automated. This required operators to do some manual tasks in the process to make connections and to open the fuel channels for access. Now, when WR1 reached the end of its research mission, it was safely shut down. Fuel was removed and the coolant and moderator systems were drained. The reactor has since been completely, has since remained in storage with surveillance. Next slide, please, Rachel. Now, construction of WR1 began in 1963 and when the site was excavated all the way to the bedrock, a depth of approximately 60 feet from the surface. The foundation of the building is constructed of heavily reinforced concrete and rests directly on the bedrock at the site. Before pouring any concrete, a weeping system was installed to collect and remove groundwater, and then a leveling slab was poured over the weeping system, again covered there by a waterproof membrane. Onto that, the main foundation was poured. So uh, a three-foot thick concrete slab was poured as the main floor of the base very basement level, and this formed the bottom of what we call the 100 level. There are five subgrade floors uh, in the WR1 facility, 100 level being the bottom, then followed by 200, 300, 400, and 500, with 600 then being the floor on grade. The areas of the structure that would contain the actual reactor core were poured with what's known as heavy concrete, which uses a titanium ore as its aggregate to significantly increase its density and improve its radiation shielding capabilities. Now, the, the external walls of the facility had varying thickness with depth. So near the surface, uh, at the 500 level, walls were typically one and a half to two feet thick. While at the bottom on the 100 level, the walls poured were approximately four feet thick. And at all levels, extensive steel reinforcement was used in the concrete to provide additional strength and support. The facility is designed and constructed so that it can easily resist the external loads of the soil around the building at that depth as well as to support the above grade structures and the hundreds of tons of components and equipment that are installed in the facility. Now on top of this robust foundation, the main steel structure of the reactor hall was then constructed. In the photos at the top right, you can see the first excavation of the site. You can see a, a, quite a wide excavation had to be made in order to reach the depth they needed. In the bottom left, you can see the foundation walls being poured at the lowest levels and the extensive amount of steel reinforcement that's being placed into it. And then in the bottom right, you can see the construction of the main reactor hall as that steel structure being done uh, on top of the poured uh, concrete foundation. 
Next slide, please. Now, most of the major components of WR1, including the calandria, the reactor core, were fabricated off-site and then delivered to the site to be installed. Several of these major components even exceeded the 50-ton capacity of the facility's overhead crane, and installation had to be done by driving heavy lift cranes directly onto the main floor of the facility. As reactor components were installed, construction of the main ventilation stack and standby water tank was completed as well. And WR1 went critical in 1965, just 18 months after groundbreaking at the Whitechell site, which to think about is, is pretty impressive. In the photos at the very left, is you'll see the Calandria being constructed in, the, in its offsite facility. In the top middle, you'll see that same Calandria on the main floor of the reactor hall. And behind it, you'll see one of the heavy lift cranes that was driven into the facility in order to facilitate installation. In the bottom middle, you see the installation of the fuel channels being placed into the uh, Calandria that's already been put in place. In the top right, you'll see all the scaffolding that was required to uh, construct the main ventilation stack and the standby water tank. And then in the bottom right is the photo of the control room where reactor operations took place. Now that's an overview of the design and construction of WR1. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike English to carry on to give you guys some background on the NPD reactor. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Mike English here. Uh, good afternoon, folks in Ontario and East, and good morning for folks uh, west of the Eastern time zone. Uh, so about NPD was initially conceptualized as a pressurized water reactor, but emerging research during the design and initial construction of the facility led to a change to a pressure tube concept which meant no large pressure vessel was required. The concept evolved into the pressurized heavy water reactor that eventually became the can-do design. NPD had 132 fuel channels consisting of a pressure tube inside a calandria tube. The nominal design power output for NPD was 82 megawatts thermal and design electrical output is quoted as 22 megawatts electrical. The idea for the reactor was that heavy water coolant in the pressure tubes carried away the heat from the nuclear reaction and transferred it to light water via a heat exchanger. The light water was allowed to turn to steam, which drove a turbine connected to a generator. The concept developed for the steam and power system mimicked that uh, same one used in coal plants of the period. The major difference being the, the nuclear reactor in this case was used to heat the water to raise steam in a separate circuit rather than directly heating the water by burning coal. Reactor output was controlled by raising or lowering, lowering the level of the moderator in the reactor core, very similar to WR1. And the use of pressure tubes in NPD also allowed the implementation of on-power refueling, which was carried out by two fueling machines, like the one shown in the photo above, to shuffle fuel bundles into and out of the fuel channels. If we can go to the next slide, please, Rachel. Extensive earthworks and regrading of the site were carried out to build NPD beginning in 1957. In the photo at nine o'clock, the original grade is shown in the background. It also shows the significant amount of overburden or soil that was removed to get to the underlying bedrock. And then the folks in the 12 o'clock photo uh, are showing some of the extensive jackhammering that was carried out to excavate bedrock to the founding depths. The photo at six o'clock shows formwork reinforcing steel and concrete starting to rise from the lowest part of the facility, which is 80 feet below existing grade. And the extensive depth into bedrock is uh, shown in the background. And finally, at the three o'clock photo, the structure of the boiler room is starting to take shape. And this uh, gives a really good indication of the extensive amount of concrete that was used in the facility. The reactor vault uh, would be just behind uh, the two sort of vertical slats that are in the middle part of the photo uh, on the other side of the vertical wood pieces that were uh, that are on the side. Um, by way of comparison, just of uh, geography for the six o'clock photo, the wooden flooring shown in the nine o'clock photo is at the height of the top of the walls in the six o'clock photo. If we can go to the next slide, please, Rachel. Following completion of the concrete work, uh, after approximately 8,000 cubic meters of concrete was placed, um, everything was, was finished and uh, construction above grade began. So the nine o'clock photo shows the south exterior of the facility with the reactor calandria being backed into the facility before it's lowered into place. The concrete structure was built to about three feet above the height of the current grade, and then a steel framed superstructure with asbestos cement board cladding was built on top of the concrete. 
Following construction completion, the remainder of the components were installed and commissioned, such as the calandria and the fueling machines shown in the middle photo, and reactor operation commenced. The top right photo shows the first reactor startup in April of 1962. And eventually the site expanded as shown in the lower right. Uh, and following the end of operations in 1987, all of the buildings except the main powerhouse were demolished. Much of the nuclear equipment rem remains, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Go to the next one, please, Rachel. Good. So in both WR1 and NPD, the main radioactive wastes are the nuclear components and the equipment, which are made from metals consisting of alloys of zirconium, stainless steel, and carbon steel. Systems in each facility went through a decontamination process during station layup in the 1980s, which removed much of the surface contamination that was present. Most of the remaining radioactivity is embedded in the material, either plated to it during system operation, or through exposure to the neutron flux during reactor operation, resulting in a process known as activation. Zirconium and stainless steel are two materials that are known for their corrosion resistance, while carbon steel is often thought of as relatively susceptible to corrosion. However, the concrete construction of the facilities and the addition of a cementitious grout will contribute to a high pH environment that will envelope the metals and will dramatically slow their corrosion rates. This is beneficial because it's only through corrosion and subsequent transportation by water that the radioactivity can leave the facility. So very low corrosion rates means that releases from the facility are also very low. In fact, they're orders of magnitude below the public dose limits. And next slide, please. So containing all of these metals is the robust reinforced concrete construction of the facilities. Grout will be added to stabilize the facilities and envelope the components, which remain protected by the robust concrete walls and the foundations of the facilities. The concrete construction supports and contains any corrosion products released from metal components during their hazardous lifetime and protects the facilities from environmental hazards such as seismic and weather events. It also restricts groundwater flow and creates a favorable chemical environment. For comparison, since both portions, uh, since portions of both reactors would be considered intermediate level waste, if these reactor cores were to be removed and disposed elsewhere, it would require a disposal facility with robust concrete construction, which is a feature already offered by these existing facilities. And next slide, please. So for site characteristics, the NPD site was excavated nearly 70 feet down into the bedrock and the concrete facility was built up from that excavation. This process removed the typically weathered surface of the bedrock and exposed sound deeper bedrock that is characterized as being of high strength with moderate fractures and fair to good rock quality. The predominant rock in the vicinity of NPD is made up of different forms of gneiss and is part of the Grenville province of the Canadian Shield. This bedrock is very old and has not undergone significant movement in many millions of years and lies over rock that is even more stable. While the Ottawa Valley is known as a region of moderate seismicity and relatively large seismic events have occurred in different parts of the valley, the risk posed to the waste by seismic events has been evaluated and is acceptable. Finally, geologic borehole drilling at NPD has confirmed the groundwater velocity through the rock is low, particularly relative to the soils above. This is important from a safety perspective for transport of any contaminants that do migrate from the NPD facility because their location in bedrock means if they're released from the facility, the slow groundwater movement will take a long time to carry them to any human or non-human receptors. And while for the previous uh, facility supports, um, the, the two projects are very well aligned. When it comes to site character characteristics, um, NPD and WR1 are located in geographically very different areas. So for, for WR1, while the facility is not keyed into the bedrock, it does sit in about 60 feet of very heavily clay-based soils at the White Shell site. In fact, the, the official term for much of the soil in this area is Manitoba gumbo, uh, is because it's very dense and very sticky, very, uh, very rich in clays. Water at the White Shell site moves downward, it doesn't, uh, and then uh, moves along the bedrock soil interface. Groundwater does not really rise to the surface anywhere uh, within the, the White Shell main campus site or near WR1. Um, the clay soils also divert most precipitation away from the site as runoff or evaporation and do not allow very much water to infiltrate down into the water table. 
what little water does infiltrate moves very slowly through the soils of the site. In fact, a single drop of groundwater would take approximately 100 years to travel from the reactor to the Winnipeg River, approximately 500 meters away. So overall, uh, both WR1 and the MPD reactors are robust facilities that are designed to support the operation of the reactors and the stresses that those operations placed on those structures. These robust concrete facilities are well suited for the purpose of housing these reactors through in-situ disposal and overall are a strong layer of protection in the multi-barrier disposal systems that are planned for both of these reactors. So that concludes uh, Mike and I's presentation to with an overview of MPD and WR1 from through design and construction. And I'll turn it back to Mitch to facilitate our Q&A session. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Mike, for, for the presentation. OK, so now uh, is uh, a chance for um, the, in the audience to ask uh, some questions of both project teams. Um, and uh, I see some, some questions coming in here. All righty. First question we have, um, what alternatives have been considered for WR1 and then NPD? How much I can take the first crack at that and then I can flip it over to uh, Katie Shorter to add anything else from the, the NPD side. So. Uh, alternatives and consideration of alternatives are laid out in the environmental impact statements that both projects have prepared. Uh, both generally have the same grouping of them, though there may be slight variations. But for WR1, we looked at uh, in situ disposal, complete removal of all the reactor systems, uh, deferred decommissioning, so leaving it where it is for another 60 years until and, and, and then potentially dismantling it again. And then as well as a combination of in-situ disposal and deferred decommissioning where we would uh, remove some of the components now and leave uh, other components for, uh, for in-situ disposal. Um, so that, that in-depth analysis has been presented in our documentation that uh, can be, is available for, for the public to use uh, and see, but effectively um, WR1 and NPD are, are safe right where they are. Uh, and they can be shown to be safe, passively safe for the long term through the safety cases that we're putting forward. So it makes absolute sense to leave them where they are because we can show that it's safe to do so. Uh, digging them up, cutting them up, shipping them somewhere else for potential disposal somewhere else has a lot of unknowns in terms of where that final disposal location will be, when it will be constructed, what restraints it'll have on ha what can go in it. Um, but right now we can show that it is safe to leave them right where they are. And so that's what makes the most sense to do at this point. Katie, I don't know if there's anything you want to add there. Uh, so as Jeff noted, um, NPD has very similar uh, alternatives that were considered, but I'll repeat them here just, just so we're clear what the ones uh, considered on MP, NPD were as well. So obviously the, the alternative that we're proposing right now, which is the in-situ disposal, um, the second alternative being the remove um, everything or the complete dismantling of the reactor. Uh, third option being a, a partial dismantling um, and then in-situ disposal of the remaining. So again, very similar to WR1. Uh, in that case, the intermediate level waste would be removed uh, and transferred to uh, interim storage somewhere else and then eventually to a, a final disposal location. And then uh, the final option, again, being uh, continued storage with surveillance or that deferred decommissioning that Jeff mentioned. So same four options at MPD as well. And the same considerations as to why we really believe that uh, in situ disposal is safe and the right decision for the MPD reactor. OK. Thanks, Jeff and, and Katie for, for the answers there. Um, our, our next question is, uh, and, and I think Jeff and Mike, you, you sort of alluded, alluded to this in, in your presentation, 
the difference between NPD and, and bedrock WR1 in, in the, uh, the Manitoba uh, clay. Um, so someone's asking, NPD is in bedrock, but WR1 isn't. Does, does that make a difference to the barriers? Sure, I can start with that one. So try to answer, uh, yes, it makes a difference to the barriers, but it doesn't make a difference to the outcome of the assessment. So they're, they're both projects are similar in a lot of ways and they have, they have their differences, but in both cases, the outcome is that through the assessment, we can show that it, the conditions in WR1 and the conditions at NPD both result in a passively safe long-term situation for, for this waste, uh, regardless of the the subtle differences between the geology of the site or the location uh, through, a, through the assessment in the EIS. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, another question uh, for, for WR1, is there any consideration to putting other waste uh, into the in situ design? Um, so I guess the idea would be, are you planning on other than what's there, uh, uh, you know, right now, is is there any idea of putting other things in into the the in situ project? No, um, right now the, or the the proposal we've put forward is that only WR one wastes would be included in WR one in situ disposal. We would not be converting it into a waste facility for other wastes to be transported to the site or from other areas of the site to be disposed of here. Uh, those other wastes have a, a, a management path currently, uh, whereas WR1 does not have a current disposal pathway uh, available and would be relied on one for the future. So wastes at site that currently have a disposal path will follow that disposal path, uh, but we will not be adding them to WR1 at this time. Or then there's no plan to do it in the future. I shouldn't keep, I shouldn't keep saying at this time. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is a this is a question about, uh, I guess, regulatory approval and and uh, that if there's any sort of connection between both projects, which which I don't think there is. But I'll ask the question: What happens if one project gets approval from the CNSC and the other does not? Is there is there any um, any sort of repercussions, I guess, or, or connections regulatory wise? So I would say that that situation would be unlikely to happen. Uh, both projects have the same uh, standards that have to be met in terms of demonstrating safety, uh, showing that we, we understand the, the waste form, the environment, and the potential impacts on, uh, of, of the project on the environment. Um, so if one of these projects meets all the effective criteria, it's, it's highly likely the other one will as well. We're also strongly integrated between the two projects, so we communicate regularly to ensure that we're presenting uh, similar lines of evidence and, and similar information uh, to, to show that we're, we're learning from, from each other. Um, however, in the chance that one project was approved and one was not, we would have to kind of look at which one was approved and why and make an assessment to determine if it's it would warrant an additional application, a change, or a change in strategy. Uh, but that would be a decision that would be made at that time. And there's no uh, immediate concrete decision on what would be done if that if that occurred. Yeah, I think so, Jeff. And I think it's worth pointing out that the the, the CNSC is uh, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. They're the they're our regulator. They're an independent regulator. And um, ultimately, in the end, uh, they, they'll make the decision um, irrespective of um, uh, what, uh, what each project represents, um, I, I, I guess, to us. It's, it's more, it's up to the regulator on, on how they will, they will um, uh, assess each, each project um, independently of, of CNL. Okay, the next question here is, can either of these sites be abandoned? If not, who will maintain the required site restrictions in perpetuity? 
And then why would one want to create two sites that would require maintaining these restrictions forever? So both NPD and WR1 have three phases, the actual decommissioning execution, an institutional control period, which um, I believe is, is what this question is focusing on, and then a post-institutional control period. So for NPD, we'll be maintaining institutional controls at the site for a minimum of 100 years, but for as long as necessary. Um, at that time, it will be up to um, the, the regulator of the time uh, to make a decision about whether we would discontinue institutional controls. Um, about the, the safety and the restrictions, um, our safety assessments, um, both NPD and WR1, but I'll let Jeff jump in and talk about WR1 in a moment. Our safety assessments uh, model what happens with the contamination that is uh, within the reactors and the, grouted, the eventual grouted facilities. Um, and they model how that contamination moves out into the environment over time. And so these models uh, predict that the doses, the resulting doses to the public and to the environment are well below um, the, the Canadian regulatory dose acceptance criteria uh, and that uh, environmental components are protected as well. So that assessment allows us to believe that at some point in the future, uh, no restrictions would be required. Um, any sort of land use is possible um, beyond that institutional control period. I will pass it to Jeff, because I think there's a couple diff minor differences for, for WR1, um, and he may have a couple of other notes to add. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yeah, WR1 is largely aligned with, with NPD for, in, in terms of how we demonstrate safety. And really what the, the focus is uh, demonstrating passive safety. So part of the criteria is that we can't rely entirely on human and intervention in order for the facility to be safe. So while Institutional control is important and it is a, a barrier in the overall system to prevent intrusion, uh, to monitor the site, to understand if anything's going differently than we planned. Uh, the criteria is that we have, this facility has to be passively safe. Uh, so there are the safety cases we put forward. Um, they establish a 100 year monitoring period, not because that's how long it's gonna be dangerous, or that's how long all the waste lasts, but that's how long it takes us to verify that everything's going exactly the way we planned it to be or better. Um, and once that verification period is, is completed, that's when we would potentially make an application to the CNSC or, or whatever authority has jurisdiction at the time to discontinue monitoring or discontinue those controls because we've in theory demonstrated the facility is now passively safe and will perform its functions whether we monitor or control the site into the future. Uh, but as Katie said, the plan is minimum of 100 years uh, and to continue as long as is necessary by the regulatory authority at the time to, until we have shown uh, confidence in the facility's performance. Okay. Thank you, uh, Katie and Jeff, for your answer there. Uh, we got uh, two more questions, um, uh, so uh, encourage any others uh, if if you uh, if you have something to to ask, please get it into the Q and A. Okay, uh, the next question uh, re refers to the facilities right now. Um, if the facilities are deemed to be safe as they are right now, why entomb them going into the future? Uh, I'll start here and I might pass to, to Jeff after. Um, so I think this uh, question came up as Jeff was answering the first question uh, of the, of the Q&A today. Uh, and Jeff's comment was that, that the reactors are, are safe where they are. They're safe now. Um, and, and really, I think the point that Jeff was trying to make is, is the plan that we have proposed demonstrates that they are safe now and that they can be safe where they are as opposed to dismantling and moving them somewhere else. So I think there's sort of two pieces here. Um, these reactors are absolutely safe right now. They're in a storage with surveillance state. Um, we have facility staff that maintain license requirements to keep us in that uh, storage with surveillance uh, state. So there's ongoing maintenance and monitoring that's, that's part of that work. 
Um, and so part of the reason to move ahead with uh, uh, a physical decommissioning strategy is to, to end that storage with surveillance phase instead of having those activities continue in perpetuity and really having to have that on-site presence. The in-situ disposal that's proposed um, puts the, the sites in a, in a passively safe state where those ongoing um, surveillance activities um, and, and maintenance of the uh, deteriorating uh, reactors, um, above grade reactor structures doesn't have to continue uh, forever. So uh, Jeff, I'm not sure if you wanna add any other clarification on, on that point. Well, thank you, Katie. No, I, I think you did, you did a pretty good job. I would only add that we say it's safe here now and the addition of grout into the facility and tombing is just to, to stabilize the facility long-term so it'll continue to be safe over the, uh, the thousands of years that the facility exists. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Katie. Uh, the next um is is kind of a comment or clarification so um, not really a question but maybe uh wanting to uh um, produce a discussion um by ask by by commenting um so it's a clarification on uh the abandonment abandonment of the facilities so the note is if the site cannot be abandoned then essentially the institutional controls will have to be maintained uh, forever, whether or not that institutional control is active or passive. So, so a comment, not, not sure, uh, Katie or Jeff, if you'd like to discuss that comment or clarify anything that might uh, be uh, misunderstood. Sure, I'll uh, try, and, uh, try and clarify it and reiterate here that um, we're not saying that the sites cannot be abandoned. Uh, we're saying we're not, we are currently not proposing a fixed date when we will abandon it. Um, the CNSC won't approve our uh, proposal unless we can show that it will be passively safe, even in the event that institutional controls fail. So that is the, that is one of the, the features of our safety case that we'll, in the modeling that we've done, the predictions that we've made, the essence that we've made, uh, that the facility will perform its function, whether there's an institutional control period or not. The monitoring is part of verification and validation to demonstrate that it's doing what we said it would do. Um, and we would only get to that point if the CNSC had some confidence that the facility would do what we say it is going to, that it would be passively safe without any of the institutional controls in place. So uh, institutional controls are there to help provide confidence, but they're not required as part of our safety case. Uh, the safety case we put forward uh, says the facility will work without them. Um, so when it comes to terminating those, it's really about meeting the any requirements the CNC may put on us as part of that approval, or uh, just as I said it, that confidence we build in those predictions over time. Uh, but the idea is the state, the facility would allow the site to be abandoned or utilized for other purposes, and that institutional controls would not be required to maintain safety. I don't know, Katie, if there's anything you want to add. I think, I think you've tackled that one, Jeff. I think we'll move on. I see some other questions coming up that Mitch will pass on. Okay. Uh, the next question has to do with uh, the contaminants that uh, are being uh, entombed into the facility. So what, what exists there, there right now? And, and uh, the, the question is, what is the half-life of the contaminants being entombed? Um, and maybe, the best way of looking at this is, um, you know, what what sort of, uh, I guess, uh, can, can we easily explain maybe some of the models of decay uh, and, and how that, that um, matches up to uh, the models of the, the in-situ structure? So, yeah, give us an idea of a, a, high, a high level idea of, of kind of what the time frames are here on the half-life of, of the contaminants and then how the structure responds to that. Does that, does that help? Um, thanks, Mitch. I, I think I'll give that a bit of a, a, an overview, really. It's a little difficult to actually explain what the half-life of the waste is because there's 
the it's not just one single uh, contaminant we're talking about. There's quite a number in the facilities. So some of them have got really short half lives of less than a year, and some of them go really a, a long time for thousands of years. But the, the longer lived ones tend to be quite low in quantity. So that's another thing we need to re reiterate as well is the amount of waste that's actually radioactive is quite low in these both of these facilities. So we're only of the, I was going to say, out of 10 to the 13, 14 becquerels, which is less than what you would normally uh, would trigger the requirement for a class one facility. So we're actually at quite a low level right now. And a lot of the, in, the waste, for, certainly for NPD, is tritium, and that will decay relatively quickly. Um, it'll be down to quite low levels again after the first 100 years or so with the initial institutional control period. So some of the longer lived ones, we they still exist for, as I said, for quite a long time, but we have a time frame that we looked at where we look at what the hazardous lifetime of the uh, waste materials are. And basically we've gone out 10,000 years to look at what that hazard remains for. And just over a thousand years, we're looking at where we're getting down to the, mac, the peak dose, which will be seen. And that is like several orders of magnitude below what our uh, dose acceptance criteria is. So we're, we're talking very low levels. And after about a thousand years, we're, we're almost approaching uh, background levels of radiation. So I think that's probably all I can say on there, Mitch. OK, thanks, Graham. Um... All right. The uh, the next question again is uh, trying to clarify more on the uh, the, the license and, and, and abandonment. Um, if if I recall, so this is uh, someone obviously who has some knowledge related to to licensing at the site. Uh, there are five licenses applicable to all uh, nuclear facilities the last one being a license to abandon. Um, and then uh, clarifying what, what was just said from Jeff, I guess, are like, essentially, are we saying that these facilities will never require an application for license to abandon? And uh, they're, they're asking us to, to justify that, that statement. So I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at that discussion. Hi there, it's Katie. I, I'll take a, a start here. So the first questions that we uh, we started with were about whether we will ever be able to abandon this site. And so that's where we sort of started our answers today. This question uh, is, is a great, or this comment is a great one. Uh, and you're absolutely right. One of the uh, licenses that's available is a license to abandon. So there is a regulatory process in place. And that's really the point we were trying to make when we said that the institutional control period would last for a minimum of 100 years, but as long as necessary, and that there would need to be a regulatory decision to end that institutional control period. And essentially that ending of the institutional control period is, is the license to abandon the site. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything more to add there, but Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in if you wanna add anything else. Oh, you, you covered it all, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Katie. And uh, yeah, I, um, we have uh, one more question here uh, and uh, we can start to wrap things up. Uh, and this is uh, now about the short-lived short nuclides. So uh, given these facilities have been in safe storage for 30 years, as was we talked about in the, in the presentation, um, what what are the short-lived nuclides that are still present uh, uh, right now in in the facilities? So I can take a take this one first, and I'll start from the WR1 perspective, and I'll let Katie or, or Graham step in if there's anything additional to add from a, an NPD perspective. But uh, there are a, a few. Um, some key ones to mention would be a cobalt sixty is one that currently exists uh, still in the activated reactor metals. Uh, tritium or hydrogen three is one that's uh, present in any nuclear reactor or any facility with uh, heavy water, uh, activated heavy water. So WR1 and uh, NPD both have uh, had heavy water. So there's tritium within the facilities. 
Um, so there are short-lived nuclides, and as Graham mentioned, they do tend to be more uh, abundant than the long-lived nuclides, uh, but they, are, they have been rapidly dropping off over the years. Um, one of the things that's actually important about short-lived nuclides like tritium is that if there are unplanned releases from either of these facilities uh, in the early years, those would be the ones that would show up during our, our institutional control, during our monitoring. So those are the nuclides that are important uh, in our uh, monitoring program to demonstrate that the facility is performing adequately. So um, and the question of how do you monitor for something that lasts for thousands of years and doesn't leave, doesn't move for thousands of years with only a 100 year monitoring period, it's those short lived nuclides that are gonna give us that first strong indication of how well the facility is performing. And, um, and that's what we would, we would be focusing on with that 100 year institutional control and monitoring period. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, that uh, wraps up uh, the q and I know we have about eight minutes left and we wanna get uh, a poll question in. So um, thank you everyone for, for, for your questions. Those were, were great questions and I hope they, they helped in clarifying. Um, I know Margo's getting up the poll here. Uh, so uh, the, the, the poll question is, um, how would you assess this webinar? And uh, you have a single choice there. Uh, excellent, good, fair, or poor. So we'll give you uh, some time to select. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Uh, mostly uh, in the excellent or, or good um, area. And was, was that it for the, the polling, Margo? I'll just double check. There wasn't another question. No, just the one poll today. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our presenters um, and, uh, and for those who helped with the Q&As. And uh, also thank you for, uh, the, uh, for, for coming, join us today, uh, participating, asking your questions, uh, extremely helpful. And uh, 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 we, we always appreciate the, the time that you spend with us. We know uh, people are busy, but... Um, we do appreciate uh, you coming out today and, and uh, asking your questions and, and uh, uh, we hope that it, it helps. And as, a, as I mentioned off the top, this will be available on YouTube uh, after we're, we're complete uh, and it'll be available in both uh, official languages uh, so you can access it later on. But um, Finally, yeah, if you have any questions that have, have co that come to you after this, uh, even unrelated to this project, but related to CNL, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. We're, we're happy to facilitate answers to any and all questions and, uh, and perhaps it will help us uh, map out uh, another topic for our webinars, which uh, we do host uh, bi-monthly. So encourage you to, to, uh, to come out to our next ones. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.